Blood Rain is a third-person action-adventure... No, is it adventure? Game developed by Terminal Reality and published by Majesco in 2002 for PS2, Xbox, and GameCube, though I will be mostly showing the PC port which was released the following year. It was originally planned as a sequel to Terminal Reality's first non-monster truck related game, Nocturne, released two years earlier. A game that, and I do not intend to be hyperbolic in the least, is one of the best, best games ever made! The lead character, Rain, was a originally penned as Svetlana Lupescu, a side character from the Nocturne universe which incidentally is interwoven into a series of licensed Blair Witch games. Early beta screenshots even show Rain clad in a similar outfit to Svetlana's. Half wanting to appeal to a wider audience and half wanting to retain the rights to Nocturne, Terminal Reality decided to create a sort of decoy Nocturne, with enough changes to allow the game to stand on its own and keep the soon-to-be-cold and lifeless hands of Majesco off their creation. Despite never getting a real sequel, Terminal Reality left a trail of returning characters and references to Nocturne throughout the Blair Witch and Blood Rain games. Some of these are slightly altered variations of elements, and some are outright callbacks. With few exceptions, Blood Rain's first outing would be met with mostly mixed and middle-of-the-road reviews. The June issue of Computer Gaming World would deem it mildly distracting, fairly generic, and thoroughly tasteless. While a similarly outdated and obsolete publication, Gaming Age, would liken its fanbase to fans of Dead or Alive Extreme Beach Volleyball and BMX XXX, two games that, well there's no two ways around this, were not well liked and not very respectful to women. I don't know if this is the best place to say this, you know, right up top and after citing its admonishments, but Blood Rain is one of my favorite games. One of my favorite characters? I'm a big fan of this game. So here is a completely biased and unfair analysis of a game most people agree is outstandingly average. When we first meet Rain, she is being scouted by two hooded members of a secret organization called the Brimstone Society. She is a half-vampire, or dampier, the result of her mother's rape by a powerful vampire named Kagan. Though she still needs to drink blood to survive, she is stronger, faster, and has fewer of the classic weaknesses vampires do. Apparently, she's just been stomping through vampire-laden neighborhoods, cutting them down in hopes that they will lead her to Kagan's whereabouts. Her first outing doesn't seem to feel like addressing that story arc right away. Instead, it acts anthologically and puts Rain to work in the Brimstone Society, only using the search for her father as bookends. Blood Rain skips over the formality of explaining who the Brimstone Society are, what they do, why she would join them, and so forth. It's clear they seem to have good intentions and function similarly to Nocturne's spook house, albeit with a creepier aesthetic. The first chapter takes place in 1933 Louisiana. Rain is accompanied by her Dampier mentor, Mintz, to investigate reports of a disease that is mutating residents of a small swamp town. The appearance of these mutants coincides with the appearance of strange biological masses that seem to be the source of the disease. And look, first time I'm playing this, by now I'm already making a lot of compromises with my excitement. Already I can see, okay, this is probably not Svetlana at all. They'd have to come up with something pretty clever to have it both ways right now. No time for pleasantries, just like your half-sister. It all makes sense! My energy was suddenly being released. God damn you guys! That's it! I'm back in! You got me, I'm invested. I care about everyone in this game. This chapter seems somewhat inconsequential and acts as more of a tutorial, and only in its last moments does it contribute to the larger plot. Rain and Mintz investigate a church where a biomass was spotted only to find it abandoned and overrun with- overrun? I'm an idiot! And overrun with mutated townsfolk. Mintz digs through the town's records to learn about their history with the disease, while Rain heads into the quarantine area to destroy the biomasses scattered around town and look for survivors. So aside from the mutants, there are also what the locals call Moricerec, or gross spider creatures that emerge from the biomasses. And on top of that, the town is half flooded, and it's near impossible to navigate without getting wet, which might not seem like a big deal. Don't even sit there like you don't know that water hurts vampires. You know what? Yeah. 
<laughs> you know what? Considering there's like maybe one or two moments where there's like a puddle of water, and this chapter is really the only place where there's water everywhere. I feel like they could have gotten away with some throwaway line of dialogue where they mention that, oh, a lot of the water here is like consecrated and holy water hurts vampires. Because even in Nocturne, Svetlana couldn't walk through a crypt that had been blessed. And plus, you know, people fucking recognize that uh, holy Holy shit hurts vampires. That's already a thing. I feel like it's a bigger stretch to just say, you know what? Why don't vampires just not like water? Which their body is probably comprised of. Otherwise, they'd be a fucking prune without that water. I don't know. I'm not in charge. They don't put me in charge of nothing. Look, the way I see it, rain is way too powerful as it is. So if she's gonna have some weaknesses, it should be a big dumb one. Rain goes around taking out all the monsters and collecting the few townsfolk who remain unmutated, telling all the survivors to meet up at a mausoleum that Mince is guarding. One of these survivors suggests a woman working with a scary German man is responsible for the increase in monsters and mutations. These moments are a lot of fun because even though Rain is just oozing sardonic wit and overconfidence in her abilities, Easy with that thing. And who'd you call ugly? She still sees value in human life, and does as much as she can to see that some good comes out of this horrible disaster. Well-intentioned as it was, uh, they all die. Uh, all these dummies are dead. They're dead. Hey. They're dead. Fueled by a thirst for revenge, Rain tracks one of the Marais wreck back to its nest. Turns out somebody's been partaking in an occult ritual. This whole thing's dark-sided. <laughs> it's okay, it's just the queen of the underworld. So we take care of that real quick. Rain notices there's a glowing rib inside its body, which seems pretty cool. Seems like a neat thing to take out of it. But upon removal of the rib, Rain is unable to control her limbs and plunges it into herself. As she's writhing in pain, the most cartoonish Nazi imaginable shows up and plunges his stretchy hand into her to retrieve the rib. Where most stories might remark on the utter failure that must be the aftermath of Rain's first assignment, this game hard cuts to five years later. In truth, it's not far from the way Nocturne functioned, where one plotline wasn't really handed off to the next. It just sort of moved on to a different place in time with little explanation. Rain, remarkably still employed, is briefed by her contact at Brimstone, Darkman, about her next mission, which is to infiltrate an Argentinian Nazi fortress and halt their plans to retrieve an occult relic. In between the assignment in Louisiana and now, the Nazis have formed an occult task force called the Geigengeist Group, or GGG, where supernaturally enhanced soldiers work to find occult means to emerge victorious from World War II. The group is led by a man named Jürgen Wolf, aka that Mr. Peanut looking mother from five years ago, the plan is a little more straightforward this time around. Rain is given a hit list of GGG members to take out, and from here on out, the story is mostly a straight line to the ending. There are a few twists along the way, but the reoccurring format from this point is finding quirky, ridiculous boss characters and one by one defeating them, while being slowed down by the numerous beehives the Nazis have kicked in their efforts to collect ancient relics. One of these, called Daymites, are a horde of unsettling worm demons with faces that force their way into people's bodies and work them like a puppet. These creatures, as well as a handful of others, are lifted directly from the Blair Witch games. The bosses include the likes of The Butcheress, a distant relative of Elizabeth Bathory, who submits concentration camp inmates to terrible experiments. I've always thought of her as the Nazi counterpart to Rain, being similarly seductive and arrogant, even having a near-identical fighting style. There is Oberpriest von Blut, who believes that he belongs to a pure-blooded race descended from the lost city of Atlantis, and has a machine gun turret podium. There is also the doppelganger twins, who were born conjoined as a result of supernatural tinkering, and now share a strange link with each other despite being separated. And I loved how they are the only enemies that seem remorseful for having to fight Rain, because despite being engaged in a battle to the death, they spend the whole time being completely enamored with her. You. You never told us your name. All of the bosses are really over the top and accompanied by fun interactions with Rain. They really showcase why I love Rain as a character. It's as though everyone is committing to B-movie schlock and this only succeeds in amusing her. She carries this mysterious and tragic interior with an arrogant, flirtatious, and patronizing anterior. I'll talk slower. Read my lips. You're dead. Any last words? 
There is a really empowering nature to her, and you can see that in the way she is treated throughout Blood Rain. For much the same reason people would go on to laud the 2016 iteration of Doom, Rain similarly instills a visible fear in her enemies. The baseline Nazi forces are so unorganized and cowardly when you're fighting them. I mean, she just tears them to shreds. Literally. <laughs> Murder. While they are desperately pleading for their lives, they'll also barricade themselves from her and try to set up little traps and ambushes. Like, if the game weren't so over the top and drenched in a darkly comedic tone, I'd almost feel bad for some of them. As it is, I like watching the struggle for a while. It's, it's not anything weird, I just like to stand over them and watch their suffering, knowing that I have the power of a gun. A single gunshot period punctuating the conclusion to a trivial collection of sentient meat. Even some of the boss characters try to bargain their way out of having to deal with her. It's a really unique aspect of this game. If I had to be critical and really put my feelings for the story under a microscope, I think a lot of what I appreciate about it is informed by both my feelings for Nocturne and the way it captured my imagination. I'm perhaps projecting and inserting more significance and depth into a story that is probably pretty shallow, silly, and, you know, I want to use the word rambling. Like, if you try to recap the story beats, it moves really linearly, as though a child is describing what his toys are doing. Rain kills this person. Rain gets info. Rain kills this person. Rain learns about the relic. Rain kills this person. Rain gets the relic. The guy she killed earlier comes back. Rain kills them again, and so on and so forth. I appreciate good storytelling and character development, but for some reason I just ended up filling in the blanks for this game, and was able to just focus on how fun it was. And at the heart of it all is a really fun character, who honestly did not deserve to go out the way she did. A planned follow-up to Blood Rain 2 for the PSP was cancelled, but from what little was revealed, it was clear the developers wanted to expand and explore Rain and several of the established characters in length and learn more about their histories and motivations. The last time she appeared in her own game was 2011's Blood Rain Betrayal, a polarizing 2D side-scroller that, despite some decent reviews, did little to revive the franchise. Add to that the fact that noted hack fraud and German tax loophole abuser Uwe Boll dragged the franchise's name through the mud over the course of not one, not two, but three heartless, brainless, lifeless, soulless abuses of a character who could have been more appreciated in pop culture were her name and likeness not forcibly tied to the oeuvre of a f***ing snake oil salesman. That being said, I still see a small but enduring appreciation for Rain. Though sadly not appearing in a new game, she appears in the work of modders, fan artists, cosplayers, and isn't that the real victory? <laughs> It's not. Just to get this out of the way as soon as possible, if you've played this game before, you can probably tell that I'm using what used to be called a cheat code, which used to be, you know, a free courtesy provided by game developers, wherein you could alter little bits of the game in fun ways. I mean, I think they still have those, you just gotta pay for them now. From day one, I've always played Blood Rain with a cheat enabled that shows your weapons attached to Rain's outfit. It's always been something that I thought made more sense to me, and it's an easier, more elegant way of keeping track of them for me. Uh, I don't know what that one does. I don't remember activating that. The gameplay I've captured here is from the PC version, which, while looking crisper and cleaner, it is a port and comes with its own quirks. I still get the impression the game was programmed to accommodate the confines of a controller, so being able to move and look around this quickly reveals how clunky some actions can be. This was already a game where you had to move fast in fights, so it sometimes feels like the game is being fast forwarded. You need to keep moving because more often than not, your enemies have guns and your primary means of attack are Rain's trademark arm mounted blades. In the beginning, you have a pretty standard melee combo, but new moves will be added to it by defeating bosses. I could never quite figure out if there was any way to control these moves on a deeper level. I think it might just be randomized as you hit the attack button, or they automatically trigger when certain conditions are met. Using your blades often leads to really satisfyingly gory results thanks to another concept that was carried over from Nocturne, which is the destructibility of bodies. Limbs and body parts can be removed at nearly any joint. So in between acrobatic kicks, one of Rain's swipes with a blade could send an enemy's hand or leg flying off with a trail of blood following behind. This usually triggers a dynamic reaction in the character that has them clutching their wounds or trying to escape. This violence is ramped up to absurdity when you fill your blood rage meter. All my life, I seem to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. 
by using enough melee attacks. Using this ability slows down time while Rain's attacks are sped up and superpowered, accessing a different moveset that is unrelenting and brutal and reduces nearly anything to a shredded mess on the floor and walls. I've always found the gunplay in this game to be really interesting. Like Nocturne, guns sort of auto-aim at enemies, but your accuracy will depend on your distance and movement. And unlike a lot of games where you hold on to a set inventory of guns while collecting ammunition for them, Rain has 8 slots for weapons, and the moment one is emptied it is discarded and replaced by whichever one is next in line. I can't think of another game that operates this way where you are at breakneck speed throwing away guns and picking up new ones like the weapons themselves are just a disposable resource. An often ineffectual resource because many enemies like the possessed soldiers and later the vampires. I th I think that's what these are, take a lot of work to properly destroy, so if you haven't picked up some of the better weapons, you could potentially empty your entire arsenal into one dude. Speaking of those vampires, either I forgot this happens, or this is a bug of some kind. But the vampires can kill you in one hit that there is no animation for. So this was real confusing. Like, you, ta you take a look at this, how is this happening? What happened there? Did he make a move that was so fast that I couldn't see it? I'll slow it down so you guys can see it. Just look right back there. Look right back there. It goes back and to the left. Back and to the left. Back and to the left. There's nothing! It's fucking nothing! Enemies won't ever attack you on their own. There's usually a decent handful of soldiers to go up against. And even if you keep moving, odds are you're gonna get shot a couple times. When Rain's health is low, she can jump on enemies to drain them of their blood. This mechanic is really well done and presents a lot of unique ideas. For one, it's really fun to do this in the middle of combat, and then just spin the person around to act as a meat shield while you drink their blood. You can also blind fire your guns while you're attached to them. As a parting gift from Rain's mentor, she she also has a chain harpoon that will grab enemies and fling them towards her to facilitate feeding. Odds are you're going to want to feed on the last person left alive, and odds are that person is going to be running away from you, so it's a thoughtful and helpful addition to your arsenal. Certain higher ranking soldiers will be able to block your harpoon, and will need to be fed on from behind. I think combat feels really satisfying, and that's a relief because if I'm honest, you're going to be doing a lot of it. It's kind of the main attraction here. It's not the only attraction though, there are a fair amount of platforming segments and escape sequences to break up the obscene amount of bloodshed. It's certainly been upstaged now, but at the time this was one of the most relentlessly violent games I'd experienced. There is a cutscene near the middle that stayed with me because I was just so delighted that something that brutal and well animated would be put in a game. It's probably already shown up in the gameplay footage because I abused it a lot, but Rain also has the ability to tap into different perceptions that are unlocked over time. Dilated perception allows her to perceive time as moving much slower. This is really helpful in getting you out of overwhelming fights by dodging bullets or in making it through difficult platforming jumps. Obviously at the time of this game's release, properties like The Matrix and Blade, and because I need three examples or I will literally die Brotherhood of the Wolf, were proving that anything could be made exponentially cooler if it was in slow motion. In any case, it is a welcome break from the absurdly fast game Play. Aura Sense acts similar to infrared vision and allows Rain to detect life, or your next objective. I can't recall ever using it, but I suppose it would be helpful in getting back to your objective if you get lost, which can happen thanks to the somewhat uniform and unnoteworthy nature of certain areas. Extruded View lets your vision zoom in like a rifle lens, and is probably the most superfluous. Try as I might, I could never quite make much use out of it. Very little combat occurs in a slow moving shootout across a field. It's almost always frantic and close quarters, so I'm really not sure of the, the rationale behind making that an option. I guess you could say the game isn't perfect, especially this version. This was the first time I've played through it on PC, and I encountered substantially more bugs than I remember there ever being on consoles. Aside from weird animation quirks like Rain seeming to struggle, in just stuff. I noticed a lot of enemies would slide off ledges and then just sort of float there, eternally stuck in their falling animation, until I put them out of their misery. This would also be apparent during the section of the game where you encounter the Daymites. They commonly burst out of ventilation shafts and ceiling tiles, but this time around they never really hit the ground so I kept having to use jump attacks to get them. It slowed things down a bit. Speak. 
Speaking of slowing things down, uh, I've seen some publications accuse Blood Rain of being too easy, and while I do agree that Rain has a lot going for her, she is certainly capable, that doesn't mean that you can't very easily and suddenly die. Mommy's not coming home ever. And to make matters worse, your game is only saved at the beginning of whatever area you just entered, meaning you could make it to the end of a good 30 minutes of playing, be confronted by a situation you don't really have time to comprehend, like being stuck in a room being filled with gas, die, and then start the whole area over again. Aside from maybe two areas, I didn't frequently die, but when I did, it always felt like a punch to the stomach. Like, I know it's coming, but I'm still shocked by how far back they send you. It took me a while to figure out how to defeat the butcherous, so I had to watch this cutscene over and over again. And I've continued to watch it since because I, I haven't learned my lesson. I need to get better. There's, uh, there's only one way. Even Blood Rain's harshest critics usually had nothing but kind words to say about it visually. For the time, it was a really nice looking game that pushed the abilities of consoles with detailed textures and reflections. The PS2 and GameCube versions suffered the most from downgrades, seeing as though neither were capable of processing bump mapping. Bump mapping refers to the technique of simulating bumps and divots in objects that are actively being affected by lighting. Now, it's easy to see all the flaws in its blocky assets and somewhat bland and unfurnished environments. It's only when you're lost that you really start to notice how barren this game can be. But if you're constantly in it and heading for your objective, you tend to forget about it. It doesn't bother me though, I, I love the way this game looks. Two important pieces of visual flair that were thankfully carried over from Nocturne were cloth effects, which outside of Nazi tapestries doesn't have a lot of time to shine. But more importantly, Nocturne's satisfying to this day blood decals. It still presents a lovely array of different splatters that trail off with body parts and drip down walls. Uh, here's the deal with the voice acting. Again, I don't want to seem like I'm exaggerating, and I don't like to just throw around the word perfect. What's that noise? It's coming from the mine shop. Aside from several sound effects also lifted from Nocturne, several of the voice actors show up in Blood Rain, including the late Lynn Mathis, the voice of Stranger, who, brief as it may be, voices Darkman. Destroy the communication center. We can't have them radioing for help. Good luck. Mary Beth Brooks, who voiced the lounge singer in the game's Chicago chapter, voices Mince surprisingly her two only acting credits. Rain is voiced by Laura Bailey, who might be mostly known for her multiple roles on Dragon Ball Z and Full Metal Alchemist. She's of course in a billion other anime dubs and video games like Bioshock Infinite, Metal Gear 5, and uh, but most of the games. She's great. She is Rain. A lot of the other voice talent comes from anime and Dragon Ball Z specifically, which is a very appropriate pool to draw from for the ridiculous Nazi characters. Can't you just imagine this coming out of Roku's mouth? Just like that stupid priest. He knows nothing but lies. The great Belaya is the original devil. I've always had a strong affinity for this game's soundtrack. It was another aspect of it that felt tailor-made for me. At that specific age, at that specific time, it's the perfect soundtrack for arriving at a well-populated location in a trench coat with several concealed weapons. It's like a more subdued version of the Molgoth remixed soundtrack to The Matrix. Other than that, there are some effectively eerie atmospheric tracks with hushed whispers and distant monster growls thrown into a wind tunnel. Even though it's near impossible to frighten me now. Ah. During my first few playthroughs, there was a portion of the game that made me legitimately uncomfortable. Once Daymites are introduced, there is a really creepy transition where they drop out the music and just show you a slight hint of Daymite, enough to utterly confuse you, and once you are face to face with them, it really feels like they just will not die. It's super unsettling. I mean, there is also the whole disgustingly gory behavior of them conceptually, but whatever! Even though the soundtrack is really cool, this is sort of a game I used to play. You know, when 
when I didn't want to think about much, when I just wanted to relax. So eventually I just got so comfortable with the game that I would turn the music off and listen to whatever I wanted to listen to. Yeah, I'd drop some what it, whatever I listen to. Uh, uh, dungeon synth, cave ambience, 911 calls. I like still listen to MP3s when she hunts. Your own eternal soundtrack, you know? I was originally planning to do some snarky reactions to negative reviews, but there are surprisingly few to be found, and even less that specifically call out the game's graphics. This might be attributed to a theory that those who have played this game have entered a pact to collectively abstain from criticizing its perfectly adequate visuals, but it could also be because a lot of people seem to have trouble playing it. Like actually just getting the game to play properly, at least on PC and the Steam version in particular. Aside from one or two people thinking it was lame or that all games should be Dark Souls now, most of the negative reviews were concerning the number of bugs and crashes they experienced while playing specifically this version. So I guess I would be in derelict of my duties as a games min if I didn't report on how the console version differs. What's he doing? He's really hitting my mom and he's just standing to the ground! How old are you? Alright. Alright, well, I'm not noticing quite as many glitches, that's for sure. What's immediately apparent, aside from the muddier visuals, is the way the controls have to compensate for lack of freedom with the camera. I feel like I just complained about the PC version being weirder than the console version, but now I'm saying the opposite. I don't know what I want. This rings true throughout the entirety of my life. Thankfully, there are a lot of options available, so you can really fine-tune them until you're mostly comfortable. The camera will automatically slide back into the center when you move forward, which saves you the grief of having to continuously recenter. Gosh, playing this with an actual controller on a shitty TV where I can barely make out anything and have to adjust the brightness really takes me back. Takes me back to those days. Takes me back to those sweet, sweet days. Another thing I'm noticing is that Rain's ability to tightrope walk on power lines works as it should, whereas my PC playthrough required me to double jump my way across them, because I would move super slowly on them for some reason. Also, this monster I was supposed to follow got stuck on a tree and I had to shoot him to get him back on track. Look, maybe they're right, okay? Game's got problems. I wasn't even playing the Steam version, I was playing the GOG version, which many said was the less broken one. It's like, can we seriously just give Terminal Reality a fucking break? Not only did they kill Blood Rain's potential as a franchise, but they put her name and film rights through an industrial shredder, and then on top of that they just tossed out inferior ports of it and have done seemingly nothing to address that. People worked hard on this game, maybe some of them are even proud of it, and now it's just a limp body handcuffed to a radiator. No, no, I think that tracks. I hope I haven't given too many qualifications to my enjoyment of Blood Rain, but I can fully admit that this game showed up right in the Goldilocks zone for me, and appealed to all of my interests at the time. Vampires, the occult, conspiracies, murder, shooting things, historic accuracy, gothic industrial music, stabbing things, demons, slow motion, leather outfits, shooting things, guns, shooting things, guns. It's hard to criticize a game that seemed to be tailor-made for me as a 12-year-old boy and remains one of my favorite games. I'm sure there are tons of things wrong with it. I mean, aside from so many versions of it being broken, it's an infinitely playable game to me. Of course, it's not a deeply intellectual or challenging experience. I'm not deep diving into lore trying to figure out character motivations or anything like that. Those things are certainly important to me, but, well, clearly I have blind spots. The story is predictable and direct, and if it weren't for its loose association with Nocturne, I probably wouldn't have been as invested as I was. I will admit that there are a lot of gaps I just mentally filled with the Nocturne lore, and I get that in the past couple years we've done some new, exciting, and interesting things with third-person combat. Well, we did mostly one thing that developers keep trying to replicate, but I still find the gameplay in Blood Rain cathartic and satisfying, if a little wonky. Uh, pretty wonky. It's visually fine. I'm certainly not nearly as impressed by the cloth and water effects, but I am not really picky either. You could put out a game that looked like this next week and I'd think that'd be pretty cool. The voice acting is ridiculous in a very amusing and silly way, and I think that's what they were going for. The soundtrack has some bangers on it. I think of it like Blade, Evil Dead 2, Danger 5, Elvira, Max Payne. 
and uh, you mix it up. Look, I'm trying to undersell this. I really am. It's probably a bad game, and I'm just not seeing it. But you know what? We can blind ourselves to all sorts of shit. The film adaptations of Blood Rain, certain Star Wars installments, your father not talking to you in six years. So, I mean, I can recommend this game all I want. I think it's tons of fun. Mindless, repetitive fun. And that's okay sometimes. So if you just want to slice up some dudes for a while, maybe you don't want anything heavy to think about because of that shit with your dad, then just pop this in and if it doesn't crash in the first five minutes go ham on some dudes shoot some guys there's one thing I advocate wholeheartedly yeah maybe I shouldn't do that